Hi, and welcome to week eight. This is it, the last full week. So we're going to be looking at week eight. Uh, I want to just check in with you with week nine. Um, week nine, you have your project due. Uh, it's due on Sunday by noon. Okay, um, and here's a description of it, just like it is in your uh, syllabus. Okay. And then the exam, final exam, will be on open up on Monday and be due on Tuesday. Again, you'll have two hours to take it uh, from the time that you open it, and it'll be available for about 36 hours, and the details are in the syllabus. Okay, so let's look at week eight. Okay, there's this video right here. I highly recommend you take time to, to watch it. Um, it probably will have a test question on it, but the the actual video is really important for everyone to understand uh, fiat currency and who controls the money. Um, so I found it. I thought I'd share it with y'all. Uh, it seemed really appropriate for this topic. And then also here's um, the Oklahoma economy of, uh, by the Federal Reserve. Uh, the Kansas City uh, office is the main office for this area, but they also have a, a branch office in Oklahoma City. Uh, they usually have three or four events before the pandemic, I think, um, where you could, uh, if you were invited to go and see or hear, uh, then talk about what the economy is doing here in Oklahoma. Well, they also have a publication out that comes out periodically about how Oklahoma is doing. Uh, so this goes through all the basics of how the economy is. It is a little bit more positive than the data states because the gentleman who writes this, who's the director of the Oklahoma branch, is a very positive person, which is nice, except it may lead to a little bit more um, hope than what the data produce, what the data actually shows. But it is... Um, and it is a laggard as well uh, because the information is a couple months old. Even though the report just came out, the data that made up the report is a little bit old. Uh, but if you'd like to take a look at that, I thought it was interesting. Uh, it was published, I think, on April 27th. Uh, the one that will be published next will have much of the pandemic in it as far as the data is concerned. But this is interesting as well. But anyway, let's get into the actual... PowerPoint. Okay, so we are going to talk about capital budgeting. So let's look at the capital budgeting. Let's see. Um, PowerPoint budgeting. Okay. So we have chapter 10. According to this, it's capital budgeting for here. Okay. Um, go through this here. This one. Okay, so understanding the key elements of capital budgeting process. Calculate, interpret, and evaluate the payback period. Calculate, interpret, and evaluate the net present value and economic value added. Okay. So the point of this week is not so much to get you to actually learn how to do this. It's to get you to understand the terminology and to know the process of doing this. Um, there may be a simple, very simple question uh, about this, um, but you would get much heavier uh, immersed in these calculations in a full-fledged finance class. Uh, I look at this class as an introduction to the terminology and the tools that you can use uh, to do different things, not so much to actually have you learn how to use those tools since this is just an introductory first year class. Okay, um, so don't, in other words, don't panic. You don't have to do a full scale uh, present, net present value of this enormous calculation. Um, but I do want you to understand what it, what it is and how it's used. Uh, calculate and interpret and evaluate internal rates of return, IRR. Uh, use net present values to compare net present value and IRR techniques. Uh, discuss uh, NPV, net present value, and internal rate of return. 
in terms of conflicting, conflicting, excuse me, rankings and the theoretical and practical strengths of each approach. These are two different approaches that often uh, would produce two different solutions. And you want to see which one benefits you the most as far as uh, probability of outcome and how that would benefit your company or you personally. So overview capital budgeting. Capital budget, excuse me, capital budgeting is the process of evaluating and selecting long-term investments that are consistent with the firm's goal of maximizing owner wealth, maximizing shareholder wealth. Capital expenditures is an outlay of funds by a firm that is expected to produce benefits over a period of time greater than one year. And operating expenditures is an outlay of funds by a firm resulting in benefits received within one year. Okay, so you have expenditures that are less than a year, basically, and capital expense, excuse me, operating expenditures that are less than a year, and capital expenditures, which are a year or greater, or it all depends on your accountant as to which one's which, um, as far as the exact one year goes. Uh, operating expenses, from what I always was told, was one year or less, and this was greater than a year. Anyway, um, moving on. So, overview of capital budgeting. Proposal generation. Proposals for new investment projects are made at all levels within the business organization. Okay, so like right now with the pandemic, lots of capital expenditures are being proposed uh, to automate uh, because people are not to be found uh, because they're afraid of, of being exposed to uh, COVID-19 and getting sick. Um, so learning how to automate would be another capital expenditures. Now putting up those plexiglass uh, type things, those would be uh, an expense that would be less than a year. So they would not be a capital expenditure. Um, and you would go from there. Uh, review and analyze financial managers perform formal review and analysis to assess the merits of investment proposals. Decisions make from typically delegate capital expenditure decisions making on the basis of do dollar limits, okay? Um, so, and then implementing. But if you look at this part here, the review and analysis and then decision making, um, capital expenditures are a great deal of, of money, of resources, and so they're limited. Uh, we just had a uh, statistic in the last, last week, uh, uh, last week or the week before, uh, about minimum wage. So if minimum wage is seven and a quarter and you can get people to work for a minimum wage or close to it, then that makes the capital expenditure uh, seem too expensive if you can just have a person do it uh, versus having a machine or technology or automation do it. If people uh, cost a lot more money, then firms uh, review their capital expenditures saying, well, this will replace X number of people. And those people now cost us $15 an hour. So the capital expenditure is financially or fiscally sound. And so we'll do that. Uh, and that's what they meant by lost jobs, because all of a sudden you can automate uh, and have it less expensive than people. On the other part of it, though, to automate and to produce what these capital expenditures are going to uh, buy uh, is normally a much uh, more sophisticated job uh, for the people that are manufacturing the uh, automation uh, devices, installing the automation devices, and repairing and updating uh, and maintaining those automation devices. So with the increase in minimum wage, you lose jobs on the cheap side of it and you gain jobs on the higher and technical side of it. So that's what I meant before when I said it all depends on how you measure whether you lose jobs or gain jobs uh, when you increase the minimum wage. Minimum wage has a huge impact on deciding capital expenditures because it's all about the dollars. Is it cheaper to buy a new machine to replace people or is it cheaper to keep uh, low wage people uh, doing the job? Okay, uh, right now with farming, they were saying that a lot of farmers are having problems harvesting crops 
because they can't have uh, low wage people come in. Normally, it's immigrants come in and harvest the crops. So, um, this might be a, a incentive for inventors to create something that would harvest the crops uh, so that the farmers can purchase these machines and not have to worry about low wage uh, employees to do it. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if that happens or not. Um, and then follow up result in monitoring the actual cost of benefits. Okay. Um, independent projects. This is always in the way, isn't it? Uh, of whose cash flows are unrelated to independent of one another. The acceptance of one does not eliminate the others for from further consideration. Um, so you could have a, a project that um, manufacturing wants, and you could have another project that accounting wants, and they don't have anything to do with each other. And so they wouldn't be considered one or the other. Um, now, mutually exclusive projects are um, projects that completely are, compete with one another. So if you have mutually exclusive projects, uh, you might have limited resources. And so one has to say which one's going to produce the best uh, return on investment uh, for the company. Uh, unlimited funds versus capital rationing. If the financial situation of the firm is able to accept all independent projects that provide an acceptable return. Uh, so this would be like Amazon or Google or Apple that have virtually unlimited resources. Uh, and then capital rationing is the financial situation in which a firm has only a fixed number of dollars available for capital expenditures and numerous projects to compete for these dollars. So those would normally be your smaller firms or firms that uh, are having a hard time with cash flow right now. So this might be a Ford or General Motors at this point, or a Boeing or Delta Airlines, American Airlines, something like that. A Carnival Cruise would be another one uh, that's rationing right now. Um, overview of capital budgeting opinion. An accept-reject approach is the evaluation of a capital expenditure proposal to determine whether they meet the firm's minimum acceptance criteria. Uh, ranking approach is ranking the capital expenditures projects on the basis of some predetermined measure. Uh, rate of return is the normal rate uh, measurement they use. Um, Benning Co oh, that's an example. We're not going to do that right now because I'm almost out of time. Okay, so. Uh, here's relevant cash flows that you can see um, with different projects and how to compare them. And then net present value is how you actually calculate that. If you go online, you can get a net present value cal calculation website. And that's why I'm not going to worry about it right now. If you get into a higher finance class, they'll teach you how to use a, a scientific calculator to actually create the net present value. Uh, if you don't do it very often, uh, you can go online and get a calculator. And I think I have those on the announcements as well. I think there's a link on the announcements for those calculate those calculations that you can have. Okay, and I think as a personal finance example, so you could review that to actually find out uh, your cash flow and your investments and internal rate of return, and then comparing NPV versus IRR. Okay, so. That's the end. No more lectures, no more videos. And I hope you had a great summer. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Remember your projects uh, are due on Sunday and uh, the final is Monday to Tuesday. And you still have your discussion board this week as well. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to reading your projects and listening to you present them.